Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today, man? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. And because you gave me a little bit of a sneak preview about today's episode, I'm excited to hear what you've got lined up for us today. Yeah, this one's pretty cool. Every year, between including this new year, between 20 and 30 people get a phone call. It goes something like this. Congratulations. The MacArthur Foundation has determined that you are a genius and we'd like to send you some money. Uh, unlike my parody of the actual phone call, the money, this is real, and the money they send is serious. And these days, it's $625,000 paid Whoa. to the person over five years to use however they want. So that's great for them, but so what? What does that have to do with copywriting? Simple. These people get the award because the foundation gives it to them explicitly because of their creativity and their originality. Something every good copywriter wants to get better at too. So stay with me here now. What if you could travel around the country interviewing these people and coaxing from them their creativity secrets? Well, maybe you could, but someone already did, and she wrote a great book about it. Denise Sherkagian interviewed 40 MacArthur Fellows, as they are called, and the book she wrote is entitled uncommon genius how ideas are born so i cherry picked some of the best revelations especially those i thought would help us copywriters increase our own personal creativity but i didn't cherry pick anything in what comes next i'm giving you the full unedited version right now copy is powerful you're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health and finance and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So here's what we're going to do. I selected three categories that all of us are going to relate to. First, intuition versus judgment. Second, luck. Third, staying power. That is, what motivates you to stick with a problem or a project that's giving you a hard time? And Nathan and I will sort of discuss this after the end of each section. Before we do that, I'm going to cherry pick specific answers from MacArthur geniuses. And I want to tell you, there's no one answer that the author got from every genius on the topic. The answers were different. Some of them even seemed contradictory. And that makes sense since these people are unusual individuals. They range from movie directors to composers to anthropologists to professors. I mean, who knew that professors could be so creative? But <laughs> some of them really are. Take our friend Doug Pugh, copywriter, Doug Pugh, who used to be a professor. He's been on this podcast, friend of the podcast. So very creative. Anyway, we'll take a tip from three geniuses in each of those categories and then to the fat about it a little bit. And we'll look at how these ideas could prove to be a boon for you, for any copywriter or creative entrepreneur. So let's get started. First thing, let's look at intuition versus judgment. Now, this is a major conflict for most creative people especially including copywriters. And the conflict is, should I depend on my intuition or should I use cool-headed, clear-eyed judgment? Mm. There are good arguments to favor one over the other going both ways. Fans of intuition say things like, well, judgment constricts thinking and possibilities and does not help you develop new angles for sales. People who favor judgment say things like, Intuition doesn't take test results into account. Hell, intuition can't even count from one to 10. Now, it's interesting there's no consensus on this among the geniuses, but that's okay. 
I think we'll find a way to sort this out after we hear what the others have to say. So let's start with Ralph Shapey. He's an American composer and professor, and he says, I've had all my life a series of strange, indefinable, instinctive feelings and visitations that bypass logic and make no sense. I think of these moments as something instinctive at work. Call it intuition. I don't give a damn what you call it. I think these moments are something instinctive at work. Ralph Shapey. So I would say this. Intuitive hunches are not as rare as knowing whether or not to feel confidence in those hunches. It takes time and experience to know. For some people, like me, but not only me, there's a solid feeling right down in my gut. Really, when I have that feeling, I know there's a good chance it's a good idea. And that didn't used to happen years ago. But over time and with experience, I learned to identify it, to feel it. And a book called Focusing, Focusing by Eugene Gendlin, G-E-N-D-L-I-N, gave me some good guidelines about this. So often I'm too excited to check with my gut when I get the idea. So I don't right away. I don't act on it right away either. But then later, I've calmed down a little bit, rolling it around my mind. I will gut check the idea. Now, as for judgment, judgment, let's listen to what Derek Walcott says. He's a poet, he's a playwright, and, oh, wouldn't you know it, a professor. He said, a professional knows what is good and what is not good. You know, you judge. If it's lousy, you throw it out. Only an amateur tries to save it and defend it. A professional knows better. Okay, that sounds like a different point of view, but I'm going to show you in a sec why I think that it's not different from the first genius's viewpoint. First, though, before I do that, let me tell you about our third genius for the topic, filmmaker Fred Wiseman. He combines intuition and judgment. In the book, it says it's instinct or intuition that tells him what to film, but it's judgment is the driving force for his decisions when he's editing days worth of footage into a two hour film. Okay, so those are the tips. Let's review what these geniuses had to say about intuition versus judgment. See, I think they're saying the same thing. I know that's weird. I think they're saying the same thing. In the case of Ralph Shapey and Derek Walcott, even though it sounds like they're, you know, in totally opposite corners, I think they're just looking at the different ends of the same process. Because intuition is how you come up with ideas. And later on, and definitely later on, you judge them. And not right away. You should really sit with an idea for a while at first. So question, what builds intuition and judgment in a creative person? Strangely enough, the same thing. Lots of input and lots of experience. Lots of learning some failures, and some successes. Intuition is usually how the ideas arrive, and judgment is how you know what to keep and what to throw away. But it's what's happened in the past and how you've integrated that into your thinking that builds up your intuition and judgment. And to be fair, it doesn't always work that way, but it usually does. And so that's a good starting point for looking at these two things. And regardless of where they fall in the process, both judgment and intuition are like muscles. You can develop and improve them through repeated use. And in copywriting, this is finally important. You need to come up with new ideas, even if the ideas are just interesting variations on existing ideas. And then you need to be able to assess, to judge what's gold and what's trash. And you do a better job with both of these things as you develop and refine your intuition and judgment. So Nathan, what do you think about all that? I think it's falsely framed as an either or question because you clearly laid out both have their reasons for being and the two work together. I think that if you're somebody who's thinking it's one or the other, you're missing the magic that comes from combining the two. Yeah, I, I would agree. And there, you know, I think there are a lot of people who are afraid to make a decision 
or afraid to be held accountable for what they say and so they say, oh, I'm just an intuitive person. I'm creative. I mean, yeah, well, uh, that's only half of the picture. All right. Um, enough. Enough scolding for now. We can do more later. All right. Um, let's get to the second category. MacArthur Genius Secrets About Luck. Luck. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've observed that a lot of really successful creative people, copywriters, entrepreneurs, and others, credit a good measure of their success to luck. And it might sound like a cop-out to you, but I don't think so. I think luck is a real thing. However, I also think you can influence it, maybe not control it, but definitely influence it. You know, there's a famous old saying, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And people who say that may be telling the truth. But that doesn't mean it's a universal principle that works for everybody. I mean, if that were totally true, then the bricklayer who works double overtime would be the luckiest person in town. Not always true. So the harder I work, the luckier I get doesn't always pan out, does it? Still, hard work is probably almost always a necessary ingredient to be successful in your creative efforts, and for that matter, to attract luck. But it's clearly not the only thing you need to bring luck your way. So let's check in with the geniuses. Now, maybe a better saying than the harder I work, the luckier I get, especially for creative people, is from French inventor Louis Pasteur, who said, luck favors the prepared mind. What does prepared mean? Basically, it means being super attentive noticing things. Anthropologist Ian Graham got lucky by noticing people at dinner parties when they kept mentioning the Mayans, and he ended up becoming a world-famous expert on their history by being attentive and following through. Copywriters can and should be super attentive, too. This is one reason you should watch TV shows you don't want to watch and read books you don't want to read. One of the examples a little later on in this section on luck, which I'll tell you about in just a second, the part about the woman who won the lottery twice, I mean millions each time, came, that example came from reading a book I never would have read in a million years if I weren't in a book discussion group where the rules of the road are generally, we read books we normally would never read. It was a good book, too. I also learned about fireflies in Thailand, superconductors, and the doomed but luckily not tragic Millennium Bridge in London. I didn't think I'd get anything useful out of the book, but in a few minutes you'll learn something encouraging about the lottery you probably never knew. But first, let's get to the second secret of luck, and it comes from genius Robert Axelrod. Now, you may have heard Curiosity killed the cat, but it's a 50-50 bet that it was a pretty creative cat. And what the book says is noticing, being observant, noticing has a cousin, which is curiosity. For political science, Robert Axelrod, who ran elaborate computer simulations to find out what would get people to cooperate and live in peace in a world where everyone's favorite photo is a selfie, he's a very curious cat, Axelrod, and he won a MacArthur. And P.S., as curious a cat as he is, as of this date of recording, he's still alive. The third genius secret of luck is being playful. So genius Bill Irwin is an actor, a comedian, and has studied at the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Clown College though he has quite an accomplished career on screen and stage. In the book, it focuses on a performance art class he teaches where he teaches students how to trip, stumble, and fall away in what looks like a dead faint. Being playful is how he creates. Okay, so when you think about luck, you might not think about copywriting. You might think about the lottery. A lot of people do. But... Do you think about Evelyn Marie Adams? In 1986, she won the New Jersey lottery for $1.4 million after winning a $3.9 million 
jackpot the previous year. Whoa. Yeah. An article in the New York Times quotes a bunch of professors of math saying her win was basically statistically impossible. You know, engineers have also said that the bumblebee cannot fly. So, I mean, I'm not that good at stats. I don't know enough to make a comment one way or the other. But one thing I do know is she had been playing the lottery every week for 15 years before she made the big haul. And she estimates she had bought about $5,000 worth of tickets over time. Every week she would buy several tickets. And this gives new meaning to the saying, if you want to win the lottery, first you have to buy a ticket, maybe even more than one. But I think the larger point is if you want to create everything, if you want to be lucky, you have to try stuff and you have to try it more than once. If you want to attract luck, it also helps to pay attention to all kinds of things, put some play into your life and be as curious as you can, as often as you can. Nathan, what lucky things do you have to say? <laughs> I only have one thing to add to that, and this is an observation of what people might attribute to luck. I work with a lot of very successful people. I consider myself to be pretty successful as well. Having, taking the, def the time to define what you want, taking the time to say, I want to have this kind of a business and sitting down and, and plotting out how you're going to get there. Once you've determined for yourself, this is what destination I want your mind will start picking up on clues that you might have not seen before. Paths will start clearing the way. Mentors will show up in your life. You are a perfect example of that for me. When I decided, hey, I want to be an A-list copywriter. I want to take this skill to the next level. You showed up in my life and we started working together. And it was like one of those things that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't clearly defined this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. And in copywriting, the same thing. If you start a piece and you have no idea where you want to go with it, good luck. <laughs> but if you have a clearly defined, this is what I want to deliver with this piece of copy, and this is the one action that I want people to take at the end of this piece of copy, clearly defining what, you, what you're working towards makes luck, if we want to call it that, a lot more possible. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll buy that. And actually, what you're talking about, which I... I think it's basically, you know, having a purpose, having an objective, having a focus really, really ties into the third category, which is staying power. And one of the people anyway, staying power, endurance and stamina. So let's let's get to that. OK, so Einstein and Einstein was a creative guy. It was once rumored to have said, it's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. Now, you know, he might have been so smart after all, but staying with problems longer is definitely one of the creative genius characteristics, at least as far as Einstein and the MacArthur Fellows are concerned. Let's think about it. It's easy to stay with something if all the problems are easy and you can solve them quickly, but it doesn't always work out that way, does it? So here are some findings from MacArthur geniuses on this long-term stamina question of how to keep at it, even when others would have given up. What keeps them going when the going gets tough? First, and, and this is really weird, but you'll see how it's true, and it may not be true for everyone, but and it's probably not true for everyone, but it's really interesting. It's the desire to do something else. So John Sayles has written five novels and acted in 11 movies. And it's not because he wanted to be a novelist or he wanted to be an actor. He did those things just so he could keep pursuing his desire to make films as his own screenwriter and director and producer. You'll see in a minute. Plus, he's no slouch in that department either. He's been the writer and director of 18 films. In the book, he said... I realized that for me to exist as a director, I would have to put my own money into things. So I've consciously been trying to build money up. It's not that I would ordinarily be that prolific. It's just that to make movies, 
you need a skill or a scam to support the work. I'm lucky I can write and I like to write. So what he does he has a day job of writing screenplays for other directors. I mean, that's odd, right? Because a lot of people would do anything to write a screenplay. He just cranks them out in order to raise money for his movies. Uh, I've got two examples outside of the book, but they're fairly well known um, to some of us. And um, one is Frank Zappa, the rock star, um, you know, of several decades ago. Not everyone knows this. He was a classical composer. And he did the whole rock band thing and, and the record thing as a way to buy the time to fund his composition of classical music. Um, not like 18th or 19th century classical music, more like Edgar Varese. But yeah, um, and singer Joni Mitchell was, and she's still alive, is a painter. Like to paint paintings, not, not a house painter, but a, a painting painter and artist. And she made records so she would have enough money to take time off to paint. I mean, it's a bit of a switch from the typical mode of having a day job so you can do your music thing. But for those two, it worked. Okay, second um, genius, Howard Gardner. He had a different view on staying power. He made a fairly obvious but critically important statement to the author of the book, Creative work requires, I think, being able to work on things for years. Just that ability. Indeed, there is something about Howard Gardner's drive and energy. Not everyone has it. I mean, I certainly don't have his level of energy, for example. But having a sense of purpose is something that anyone can develop. Nathan, I think you just talked about it. And I've certainly been able to develop that myself. Anyway, regarding Gardner... He visited China in 1987 to study the Chinese approach to creativity and arts education. Went to China, studied it. When he got back home, he sat down and wrote a 400-page single-spaced book manuscript in six days. Now, not all of his books come that fast, of course. And to be sure, speed is different from drive and energy and purpose. Um... As far as Howard Gardner, just as a side note, I particularly like his work on why IQ often misses the point. And that book is called Multiple Intelligences. Our third and final MacArthur genius tip echoes an earlier one. So the desire to do something else, like with John Sayles or Frank Zappa or Joni Mitchell, it's a powerful version of this, but it's only one of many possible versions of this third secret. And this third secret for stamina and staying power is just the why. Journalist and author Ved Mehta says, the why is important and it's different for everyone. He also says, writers may have something in common with nymphomaniacs. They keep going, they have to keep going more and more and more. Interesting and no comment. <laughs> So let's talk about another writer, not a MacArthur genius, but certainly just as amazing, who also happened to lead Britain through World War II, Winston Churchill. He had a short speech, very famous speech, which is right on the topic of stamina and perseverance. Never give in. Never, 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 never. In nothing, great and small, large or petty, never give in, except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. For copywriters, force in the enemy might be distraction, the desire to quit, or a crazy idea to change direction at the worst possible time. So look at it this way for a second. Real creativity isn't just coming up with good ideas. It's carrying out good ideas and seeing them through to fruition. Nathan you got any thoughts about staying power? Oh, man, we could do a whole podcast episode on just this one point. So I'm going to try and keep it as brief as possible. I'm thinking of the Acres of Diamonds story where the guy gives up right before he finds the diamonds. Uh, I'm also thinking about force and flow and compound bows. Have you ever shot a compound bow, David? 
No, I, I shot like a regular bow. That's that's not a compound bow, is it? No. So compound bows have this thing where the first initial part of pulling them back, pulling the arrow back, is it's very difficult. It it's a lot of weight, and and it's uh it doesn't come very easy. But there's a part where you hit about the midway point or two thirds of the way back where the little gears on the compound bow flip over and then it all of a sudden becomes really easy to finish pulling it back to that point. And a lot of times in any kind of endeavor, being able to push yourself through that initial part where it's difficult, where you're having to do the study, where you're having to research and look up the terminology and all this stuff. And then you just hit this point where everything starts to fall in. We've talked about this before in different episodes, but being able to find enjoyment in that initial struggle and in the tr in the journey of getting to that destination where everything becomes flow um th it's a skill it's a practice it's something that i have to keep refining in myself but i've noticed that getting to that point getting to that break point where everything starts to flow has become a lot easier and so um practicing finding the enjoyment in the initial force part and then knowing that eventually after I do this research, after I interview the customers, after I uh, do the hard part of the mathematics behind the cost per acquisition and the average cart value and all of these things that just are super boring to me. But once I get all of that stuff lined up, then I can get into that flow. Um, it's, it's like the digging and digging and digging right before you hit the diamonds. There's, there's something magical to it. So if anyone from the MacArthur foundation is actually watching this podcast, that's why you should give Nathan a fellowship. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that, no, that was really good. Seriously. That was seriously good. All right. So, you know, today we've talked about, um, three, three things that we can learn from the MacArthur Fellows, MacArthur Geniuses, intuition versus judgment, luck, and staying with it. I, I hope this has been useful to you. And the book is Uncommon Genius, How Great Ideas Are Born by Denise Circadian. And we'll put a link in the show notes and get it on Amazon. So that's about it, Nathan. David, another fantastic book. And I really like how you took these everyday life situations and tied them into copywriting. When you first told me about this episode, I was like, I don't know how that's going to fit, but you did a good job of tying all this stuff together. So thank you for that. And you listener, if you want to check out more episodes of this podcast, if you enjoyed what you heard today, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com. You can get a bunch of other episodes there. You can like and subscribe to the show there as well. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later.